Okay. Okay. So we won't, uh, we won't hold on for him then. All right. Well, let's, let's start with some basic introductions. Um, first of all, welcome. If what you're looking for is uh, this session on equatorial rainforests, what we're calling Earth's three green hearts, you have found the right place. Um, so I will start by just uh, giving us a chance to uh, kind of settle in together and um, with the invitation to say where you are on the planet right now and what is something about tropical rainforests that you know that um, brings you some joy or delight? What is it that is so wonderful about tropical rainforests and all of the beings that live there? So uh, again, start with start with your name and and where you're calling in from, and I'll I'll model this. So my name's M Michelle. I am in the Santa Cruz Mountains in coastal California, and the thing about rainforests that fills me with delight uh, these incredible metallic blue butterflies that I saw on Sumatra. Uh, I'm Paul, I'm also uh, in Santa Cruz and out in the mountains uh, near the beach. Um, there are so many things I love about rainforests, but they are miraculous uh, uh, and, and create their own rain, I think is uh, my favorite thing. Um, I love that just as a metaphor. I think often uh, sort of the challenge of our time is that we have to learn to make our own rain. Um, but anyhow, that's me. Thanks, Paul. Leoma, are you ready to go next? I'm Leoma, Santa Cruz, fairly near the ocean close enough to be in the maritime zone of the summer fog. Um, Paul spoke of rain and this area is in definite drought. Um, and I know the rainforest only through videos. But it's always touched me as this incredible ancient place of diversity. And I know it's very important for the health of our planet. Thanks, Leoma, and welcome, Polly. Um, so we're just going around and making some introductions. And uh, Fahim, are you ready to go next? Hmm. Uh, we see a uh, name and a picture for Fahim Rahman Rafi. And we'd love to hear from you if you can. Okay, um, and Fahim, we're happy to get back to you if you're still working that out. Oh, ha have you got it? Um, let's try Roy. Uh, Roy, can you tell us where you're calling from and something about rainforests or the beings that live there that fills you with delight? Yeah, I'm from New York. And I really enjoy um, watching a lot of the National Geographic and nature documentaries when I have time. Really, like Planet Earth, so I really enjoy 
of the rainforest uh, documentaries learning both species, plant, and animal. Thanks, Roy. Uh, Shaheem, are you able to come on yet? Okay, well, let's pass it to Polly. Hi, Polly. Hey, Michelle. Um, give me a second here. <laughs> um, well, what are the questions I'm answering? Oh, so um, where, where you're calling in from? And uh, one thing about rainforests that fills you with joy or delight. Okay, um, I'm calling in from Ben Lomond, California, just up the road from you. <laughs> um, my, what fills me with delight about rainforests, gosh, everything. The fact that they, that it rains almost every day and that, that, that the life there is, it's teeming. A healthy rainforest is just teeming with, with amazing species that, and I'm amazed, I was, the one time I was in the rainforest, I was amazed at the number of plants that are, are health-giving, life-giving. We can't let that go. Yeah. Thanks, Polly. And um, I just, Fahim was able to share in the text, he says also the, the range of biodiversity. Yes. yes. Okay. Oh, and he's calling from Bangladesh. Welcome. Or is is from Bangladesh and is Fahim how I should address you? Just going by here, okay, <laughs> wonderful. Okay, well, um, I don't wanna have us wait too much longer. So I'm gonna go ahead and start um, by introducing a little bit about Nova Sutras and the Three Green Hearts, Earth Three Green Hearts project or concept, um, and then have Paul tell you a little bit more about how it got started. And then we'll bring our friend Remy on, uh, who is saving his battery so that he can for sure be in contact with us uh, when he, he gets his turn to talk. So we'll see how long we can, can have him on for. Um, so I'm gonna just, share a few slides to get us started. And um, <clears throat> we've gone through introductions and I'll be telling a, a little bit about um, our organization, how we, how we started this project uh, along with Paul, and then we'll talk about these three green hearts of Earth, the three major equatorial rainforest systems um, in a little bit more detail. Then offer a meditation, and then we'll go into some conversation, some small group uh, conversation, and then larger group conversation, and then do closing. Um, so Nova Sutras is an organization that works from these basic principles inspired by nature. So we're working with a deep sense of reverence for nature. Um, and that can be expressed in so many different ways. But we recognize these principles that we learn in nature that change is essential, inevitable and important that complexity and maturity emerge from diverse cooperative relationships. And so we believe that the beauty of the living world 
is meant to be savored, honored, celebrated, and protected. These principles inspired us uh, to start projects that have to do with preserving some of the most important um, places on earth in terms of biodiversity, in terms of uh, climate. Many people are familiar with the Amazon rainforests. Um, similar to that, the Congo rainforest in Central Africa is defined by this massive river moving through at the Congo River, whereas Sundaland is a little more complex because we're talking about the islands and peninsulas of Southeast Asia. All three of these major sites of equatorial rainforests um, have their own unique biodiversity, but also have a lot of things in common. Nova Sutras is part of the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative. Uh, we've signed on to their Faith for Forest Pledge, and you can find out more about that on a portion of the Nova Sutras website called Earth's Three Green Hearts. Yeah. So, um, We're going to be talking again with a little bit more detail about Amazonia, Congo, and Sundaland. Um, but we'll start with the first project that we took on, um, which was Amazonia. And for that, I'm going to hand it over to Paul. And Paul, did you want me to keep showing slides or shall I? Um, you can keep showing slides. I think this is gonna be a pretty brief introduction then we'll come back to it. Yeah. I remember the uh, schedule, right? So, yeah, so, so this, for, for now, just, just sort of the history of how we got into uh, the Amazon project and how that led you to the Congo project. So I had been, um, a climate researcher and educator for uh, a few years. Uh, and in that capacity, you, you see uh, reports about the Amazon all the time uh, because a loss of the Amazon rainforest is uh, like the second most dreaded climate tipping point. So um, I was very aware of it from that perspective. Um, <clears throat> and then there was a, a study early in 2019 saying uh, that they thought maybe, it could, you know, that um, loss uh, could be triggered as, as soon as 2021. And I felt like I had to do something. Uh, so Michelle and I spoke and decided that uh, we would try something called Amazon for Amazon. Uh, that uh, was a campaign to get Jeff Bezos, the world's richest man, <laughs> to use some of that uh, uh, great fortune of his from Amazon uh, to sort of pay Brazil not to destroy the rainforest. Um, and it was a pretty fun campaign and who knows if it played any role, but he has at least uh, created uh, an earth fund with $10 billion the largest single uh, case of climate philanthropy in America. Anyhow, <clears throat> to promote this, I went online and almost immediately was contacted by climate activists in Africa, um, you know, because they, they were seeing all this attention uh, to the Amazon because of the Amazon fires, but uh, there was so little attention to Africa, which uh, I learned from Vanessa Nakati of Uganda. She's just this incredible, uh, incredible uh, earth advocate. Uh, it's wonderful. Anyhow, I learned a lot from her about that. 
Um, and that led me uh, to start working <clears throat> with African activists to publicize uh, the incredible toll that climate change is taking on that continent. And also um, connected me with uh, Champions of the Congo Rainforest, which is the second largest on earth. Um, and if he's able to join us, uh, our, we have uh, a speaker named Remy. He is uh, on the left there in the bottom corner. Um, Remy is a, a geologist and an activist in the Congo, uh, where being an activist is really not safe. Um, and, and just a, uh, an amazing human being. So it's been fun learning uh, from him about this less well-known, but uh, vitally important rainforest. So, um, Paul, do you want to try to get Remy on on the yeah. call? Yeah, I've been doing it um, this whole time, and he's kind yeah. of not responding. I'm wondering okay. if may maybe we should adjust our schedule a little bit. Sure. And I, I could do a little bit of the more uh, detailed yeah. More uh, say a little more about the Amazon. Okay. Um, so let's. I'm going to encourage you to do that, and I will uh, queue up some slides about that, and then we'll we'll move on accordingly. Okay. Excellent. Uh, or yeah, you got. Uh, what you can see there um, Not yet. is it, oh, okay. I, I see that you're starting screen sharing, but it, I'm just seeing a black screen there. Uh, I think you have to give him authorization to share his screen. No, he's got that. Oh. No. Uh oh! Oh, I think it's an internet thing. The whole thing. And then we lost Paul altogether. Oh, and you're back. <laughs> uh, Zoom is definitely not uh, in great shape today. Okay. Uh, that never happens. Okay. Well, tell you what. While you work on that, I realize we got a couple of new people in who didn't get to introduce themselves. I see uh, Cecily's there with Polly now, and Liza came on. So, um, Cecily, can you just say hello and uh, tell us one thing about rainforests or the beings that live there that fill you with joy or delight? Well, I grew up in Zambia, so I was a, a stone's throw from, from the rainforest, essentially. Mm -hmm. I spent my childhood in the bush. I love what the rainforest offers us in terms of the biodiversity of plant and animal life. And um, it just breaks my heart. I visited Zambia some years ago to see the devastation. The bush has been leveled in, in lots and lots of areas and it breaks my heart and partly folk are making money by selling charcoal. Anyway, so that there's a there's a space there that mm -hmm. oh, I need to fill. Thank you, Cecil. Activism. And Liza, welcome. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm sorry I don't have my video in this moment. But okay. I'm very glad to be here. I came on um, a little bit late. I apologize. But I, I just wanted to tap into the great resource you're providing. And thank you so much for this presentation. And, and for me, 
Um, you know, I have not, I have not personally been in any of these rainforests, but you know, they hold really the, um, you know, the great organs of this earth for, uh, for lungs and heart and, and capacity and function. And I just feel so keenly the importance of the ecosystems there and the plants and the tribes and the peoples that live there and the animals that are given life by those ecosystems. And I just really can't put into words how important it is and how deeply I feel about it. And I'm just really grateful that you're focusing, you know, your work on bringing people's awareness to this and how people can participate and breathe into restoring a well-being to our beloved earth. So thank you. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, Paul, do you want to try again with? Yeah, let's. Your slides? Okay. Any luck? Yeah. Yes, much better. Excellent. I am so <laughs> glad to hear that. <laughs> Uh, Good. So the, the Amazon is, is the largest rainforest on Earth. Uh, it is home to more species than any other land-based ecosystem uh, and absorbs still a vast amount of CO2, uh, slowing global warming. Uh, it's less well known. The Amazon is also relieving the symptoms of global warming. Um, each day, Hundreds of billions of trees in the Amazon uh, pump 20 uh, billion metric tons of water vapor into the atmosphere, uh, which cools and, and regulates rainfall for this vast area, uh, you know, like all of South America, the Southern United States, uh, and then in varying degrees, uh, you know, the whole planet. Um, it's, it's a vital climate system um, and really just a kind of miracle. Um, there's a, a scientist named Antonia Nobra who is the one who's taught us the most about its sort of climate function. But um, he bursts into poetry when he talks about this ecosystem and its its water cycle and um, its importance. Uh, he is also someone, and I'm gonna jump around a bit in my slideshow. He is also the scientist uh, who took the initiative. He is uh, on good terms with the indigenous people of the Amazon. Um, and he has a, a wonderful quote. He says um, that Greta Thunberg says, we have to listen to the scientists, uh, but I say uh, that scientists need to listen to the wise people of the forest. And so at the end of 2019, uh, he organized with, the, uh, with indigenous leaders and activists in Europe and the UK, uh, something called Forest Cop, the first uh, climate conference ever held in the heart of the Amazon. Um, also, at the end of uh, 2019, um, he and Thomas Lovejoy, the, another scientist who studies the health of the Amazon closely, uh, warned that something they had thought was decades away was imminent. Uh, and the way they put it, really quite beautiful, they said, um, you know, we've been studying the wonders of the Amazon for many, many years. And today we stand at a moment of destiny. Uh, the tipping point is here, it is now. Uh, and then in last year, uh, they elaborated on that, talked about how basically the Amazon can't absorb 
or withstand more deforestation. Uh, and so the danger is that it could die back to dry savanna, and that process could be quite rapid, um, which would just flood the atmosphere with CO2. That's the, um, the scary side of the Amazon rainforest. But as I came to study it closely, um, what I, uh, sorry, <laughs> a little technical difficulty. What I um, came to realize, um, and I sorry, apologize for a very last minute uh, set aside. What I came to realize was uh, that it is the place where you can see in some ways uh, the, the easiest, it's easiest to see the astonishing creative power of the earth. Uh, I mean, it is, it is just this sort of almost excessive uh, creativity, this profusion of life and this astonishing variety. Um, and it is also a success story because for at least 10,000 years, um, indigenous peoples in the Amazon in much larger numbers than today, millions, shaped that ecosystem, you know, lavished it with attention and, and uh, part of the reason there's so many plants that are health giving is because, you know, they, the plants that they found were helpful, they, they uh, cultivated um, the trees in the Amazon, the makeup of that tree population, totally different because of them. Uh, and it just, you know, they did not diminish it, and yet they changed it profoundly, so we can learn so much. The uh, good news, I think, too, is that focus on the Amazon is helping us, helping to call attention to the urgent need uh, to protect the remaining uh, wilderness and, and, you know, the Earth's vital ecosystems from commercial exploitation. There are two uh, projects right now. There is something called the Global Deal for Nature, uh, and there is also a, a campaign organized by scientists, including Thomas Lovejoy, uh, and uh, economists uh, that explains the immense economic benefits of protecting a third of the planet, uh, basically, by 2030. Um, and then um, having a some protection for another 20% by then, and then full protection for 50% uh, in short order after that. Uh, this is a serious proposal. The other version of it is the Campaign for Nature. Uh, that's the one that Thomas Lovejoy and the economists are involved in, and uh, they are having some success sort of pitching that to the Davos crowd. Uh, so it's not just uh, something that activists are enthusiastic about it's it's gaining pretty wide appreciation. Uh, maybe it's the place where economists are learning how to talk about ecology, uh, which is not one of their strong strong points. Um, and yeah, this is the Campaign for Nature website. Uh, I urge you to check it out. Uh, and here's the article about. A global deal for nature and science advances. Um, I think uh, I don't need to say much more, uh, but oh, I, I'll just end with this. Uh, the activists from the UK, young activists who went to Forest Cop, that conference, they were just profoundly changed by it. Uh, and one of them, uh, who's actually in this picture, uh, said afterwards, you know, I went to the Amazon thinking that it was people versus nature. Uh, and what I learned is that's just wrong. And it's really people with nature. So that's that success story I was talking about, which is not something in the past. It's alive and well. Uh, with the indigenous peoples of the Amazon. Uh, last statistic, the uh, areas that are indigenous protected areas uh, ha are still emitting, are still absorbing rather, a, a lot of CO2. Uh, 
they're they uh, are like the the where the Amazon is glowing with health, and that's you know that's a bigger phenomenon all over the planet where there are indigenous people uh, species are surviving and uh, biodiversity is being uh, valued and protected. With that, I will turn it back to Michelle. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, in fact, um, a local Native American scholar activist, Lila June, talks about humans as uh, being viewed as a keystone species where you have indigenous populations. They're actually, humans become one of the active parts of the ecosystem that is keeping the ecosystem healthy. Uh, so that, that notion that we can learn from indigenous peoples uh, living in those rainforest locations, how to best interact with those ecosystems and how to take care of them um, and that they have millennia of wisdom about that, that scientists are just, just beginning to realize we should be listening to this all along. So um, that aspect of it is exciting in so many ways for me as an anthropologist, I just, yes, finally we're catching on. <laughs> um, uh, that one's, that one's really good news. Okay. Um, let's see. And have you heard anything from, from Remy yet? It's, it's okay. been, been long enough since I heard from him that I'm thinking we should probably not count on him. Um, sure. The part of the Congo where he is, uh, there isn't much electricity. So uh, it is hard for him to keep his phone charged. And I guess. Yeah, that is entirely, entirely understandable. Um, so what I'd like to do, and let me, let me see where we are here. I think what I will do then, um, again, you know, hoping that he will connect with us soon. And if not, I do have a, the recording that we had from uh, the last time we talked to him that we can share a little bit at least. I was going to uh, suggest that. It's pretty yeah. good. Um, but for now, I think what I will do is move into what I was going to say about Sundaland. Mm, no, that's too confusing. I'll, I'll start with what I was going to say about Congo and um, move into talking about my experiences there and in Sundaland. And then um, if we get Remy back after that, that's great. And if not, we'll, we'll play the tape from him. Um, so now I'm going to share some slides again. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So um, back in 1996, I worked in the middle of the Congo rainforest uh, at this site, kind of between these three stars, a site called Lamako, uh, which is on a tributary of a tributary of a tributary of the Congo River. Um, and the Lamako River is a huge river. <laughs> um, when you look at the area occupied by the Congo Basin uh, and realize that it's about two thirds the size of the United States. This is a huge, huge complex rainforest system. Um, and I was there specifically because uh, just this part that's highlighted is the only place in the world where we find one of our closest cousins as a species, uh, these animals commonly known as bonobos. Uh, or sometimes pygmy chimpanzees. Just like the common chimpanzees, we share, um, depending on how you look at it, somewhere between 99 and 95% of our genes. 
with these beings. We had a common ancestor, uh, all three of these sister species, chimpanzees, bonobos, and us had a common ancestor somewhere in the neighborhood of five and a half to six million years ago. Um, and then the line that led to humans split off. And it was only as climate shifted in Africa and what had been a system of small rivers and lakes became one large uncrossable river, the Congo River, about two and a half million years ago, that these guys, the bonobos, were split off from their sister species, the chimpanzees. And since that time, uh, two and a half million years of independent evolution, they are physically very similar, but, but noticeably different, um, a little slimmer, tiny bit smaller, um, particularly the male bonobos are smaller than male chimpanzees. Females are almost the same size in both species. Um, and we find lots of things in bonobos where they are a surprising different image of how to be a great ape. Uh, where in chimpanzees and gorillas, you find a lot of uh, violent competition between males. Uh, you find a lot of aggression by males toward females. This is very rare, almost unseen in bonobos. Instead, what you find is a lot of cooperative relationships, uh, cooperation between adult males and females, cooperation between unrelated adult females in a population. Um, bonobos are no notorious is maybe the right word, um, but well known for using sex as a tool for social exchange that helps to calm things down. If you put a pile of food in front of a troop of chimpanzees, you'll see violence as they compete for access to something that they want. If you put a pile of food in front of a group of bonobos, and they did this by you know, bringing a racine of bananas or piles of sugar cane, you put that down in front of a group of bonobos, everybody starts to get excited and they give these wonderful little shrieks. They have very high pitched voices compared to chimpanzees. So there's lots of <laughs> And then um, they all start to have sex. Uh, males with males, females with females and males with females. Um, and then everybody mellows out and sits and eats the food together. Now that's a dramatic oversimplification, but this is actually fairly typical behavior in those um, extreme conditions. We see it a lot in captivity where there's plenty of food to go around and they are forced into close quarters. Um, but even in the wild, we see evidence of this kind of behavior. So they've come up with ways to solve conflicts that are um, much more about love than war. So I went to Congo in 1996 to learn about that, to see how in particular um, unrelated females who are coming into a new troop form relationships with the other adult females already living in that troop, because this is something that we don't see in any of the other great apes. The great thing about the Lamaco area was that the local people had a tradition that said, you know, bonobos are our forest cousins. They are not to be hunted. So there was a healthy intact population of bonobos and the forest itself looked really healthy. But one of the things I learned as I got there was actually the forest had been pretty severely damaged. You just couldn't see it on the surface. There were lots of bonobos, but there were very few other large mammals. Those had all been hunted out. 
And the most notable was um, the loss of forest elephants, where we were walking every day, we would often find teeth and bones from forest elephants who had been hunted just to take their tusks for ivory. It still looked like a healthy rainforest. All of the trees were standing. But as an ecologist, one of the things that you find out is those forest elephants were critical seed dispersers. And losing them means it's going to be much, much harder for that forest to regenerate in the future. Uh, that as the mature trees start to die, they won't be replaced as readily. Um, I had to leave that field site and that research plan in 1996 because uh, when I was when I was there, it was as it turned out the last year of um, a couple of decades worth of rain by a really vicious um, kleptocratic dictator named Mobutu and a civil war was starting. Um, I discovered fairly quickly that I did not like being around people with automatic weapons. So I left and I went to work on a different project studying a different great ape in Sundaland. I went to Aceh province of Indonesia to study orangutans. And one of the really exciting things about orangutans, um, you can possibly see it in this and hopefully the video that I've got queued up will show it a little bit better, but these guys were using tools similar to the way chimpanzees use tools. Um, so here, here's a little video of uh, an orangutan actually pulling down a twig, modifying and making a tool using his hand, teeth, and feet. Um, and then he was, if you can see, he's, he's got this fruit here called the Nisia fruit. And what he's doing is uh, using that tool to pry the seed out. Um, and you can see that there's this other orangutan here watching him very carefully. This is an example of what we talk about uh, in primate studies as social learning. So this was a really special population. It was the only population where we were seeing tool use and social learning at this level. And it was in, um, what had already been designated as protected national park rainforest. But while I was there, illegal loggers came in and they started just cutting down, at that point, the most commercially valuable trees, which happened to be some of the most critical food species for that orangutan population. And when you take out a tree like that, it lets in a lot more sunlight and the whole area dries and then is much more susceptible to fire. Um, the orangutans that were in the area started to flee. Uh, the tigers came out for a little while, which was very exciting. I didn't actually see any, but I saw, uh, there was one time when I went out on a trail and came back 15 minutes later and there were tiger prints that hadn't been there previously. So I was near a tiger. Um, and that tells you a little bit about how special these forests are. Again, this was an incredibly biodiverse place. It had orangutans, it had tigers, it had forest elephants, Asian forest elephants there. Uh, the last few Sumatran rhinos live in part of this forest. And it was being cut down for hardwood, which I later learned is mostly used to make handles for brooms and shovels. That was our choice. Losing all of these incredible species to make brooms and shovels. 
after that first wave of illegal logging, um, others started to come in doing more serious clear cuts and slash and burn agriculture uh, for plantations to export things like palm oil and paper pulp. When they do that, um, because of the unprecedented level of forest drying, traditional methods of land clearing using fire uh, got out of control and would actually catch the peat soil on fire. And so the next time I was in Southeast Asia, 10 years later, 12, 15 years later, um, these peat forest fires were burning all on, on Sumatra and Borneo, and you could see the smoke from them thousands of miles away. Uh, for those of us who experienced the, the wildfires this last fall here in California, that was about a third of the level of smoke that I experienced on Singapore, which was hundreds and hundreds of miles away from where these peat fires were burning. And this is the kind of thing that we're losing when we lose forests like that. When orangutan mothers are driven from their homes, they're driven into areas where they don't know where the good food trees are and when they come into fruit. So it's very likely that they're going a little hungry, which means they can't nurse which means they're less likely to get pregnant. And if and an orangutan mother, if she's lucky, is going to have five or six babies in her lifetime. Each one takes five or six years to raise. So the loss of one infant is devastating to the population, not to mention devastating to these incredibly intelligent and sensitive individuals. So, um, yeah, this, this work uh, talking about and, and working to protect these rainforests is really important to me. And it's really important to us as a species. Um, one of the things, one of the research papers that, that came out um, about eight years ago, looked at the different forest types in tropical rainforests. And acre per acre, the dipterocarp forests of Southeast Asia capture more carbon dioxide than any other forest type. An awful lot of that gets stored in these peatlands, which are now burning. So we're releasing hundreds, if not thousands of years worth of carbon capture when these former peat swamps um, dry out and catch fire. So um, this is some, some hard stuff to face, but that's why it's so important that we don't let our attention waver too far, that we keep this in our minds, that we think about what we can do um, and that we hold these places with a lot of love and tenderness. Um, When Paul and I were, were talking about this presentation, we said, you know, what we want to make sure that people come away with is understanding that we have this possibility right now to actually be partnering with the rainforest, to be partnering with Earth's creative and regenerative power. And so for the remaining hour of this uh, session. 
I want to turn our focus more that way. Uh, but before we do that, one last chance here, Paul, have you heard anything from, from Remy? Oh, I'm not hearing you. You're still muted. He, he did, but just to let me know uh, that his phone had said it, it had 20% of its uh, battery life and then turned itself off. Oh. And, uh, now it says it has 10% and he's, he's so sad and apologetic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it seems like he's not going to be able uh, to manage it. Um, okay. Uh, hold on a sec. Oops. Oh. Oh, he says he's heartbroken. Um, well, what we'll do is uh, try again. Um, okay. I work. I work a lot with people in Africa, and um, you know the the broadband is terrible. There's just uh, a lot of technical difficulties. So yeah, it's just kind of par for the course. Yeah. I did want to just say one more thing about the people who work with rainforests uh, because it is astonishing to me how consistently people who turn their attention to rainforests in a sustained way are just transformed by it. I mean, I talked about Antonia Nobra, the scientist uh, who is saying we have to listen to the people. And he says a lot of very interesting things about why, about what science, our science is not good at. Uh, yeah. that, that they're very good at. Uh, but there's a journalist I, I got to know uh, from Al Jazeera who spent time in the Amazon. Her reports, by the way, are just incredible. They have a terrible title called Goodbye Earth. Uh, that's the title of the series. But, but they aren't as depressing as the title would suggest. <laughs> and, and they give you a lot of time with indigenous people and with other people in Brazil who care passionately about the Amazon, and there are actually quite a, quite a bit of hope. But but you could really see in her reports, you know, this had I think that maybe even reflected in that title uh, had just completely changed her. Um, and and so what I tend to think, because uh, my background is in political science, and I'm I'm just sort of always watching to see how are activists doing? How do activists feel? Uh, how are they expressing themselves? Because I think, you know, we have this yearning for a healthy relationship with the rest of life. And, and, and this can be a time of, of, of great joy, you know, as well as heartbreak over what we're losing, uh, joy at what remains and what we can save and, uh, what we can gain as people uh, from the process. So, and, and we can learn that the earth is not a victim, a passive victim, which I think is, unfortunately, there's too much of that talk. I think we have Remy on. Yeah. Oh, welcome. Oh. Uh, you're muted, Remy. We were hearing you for a moment. Yeah. Oh, there... Hi, Paul. Hi. I, I have no, I have an energy. I am very sorry. That's we're so <laughs> glad that you're able to make it on. Yeah, I am really, really happy to join you in this event. So, Remy, can you tell us a little bit about your work and how things are going now? Hmm. Okay. Remy, we're seeing you now, but we're not hearing you. Hello? 
I am really, and we don't have electricity. This is issues which I am, uh, I am just, I am just sorry because I can't be online for a moment because of the energy. Yeah. As you, as you know, in Congo, really, we have some problems like energy and internet issues. I have just explained to Paul about that. And I am sorry, sorry to be too late and I can't join the, the meeting. Well, well it's we're... Great, great to hear your voice. Um, and it, I think we have a little time if you, if you want to yes. say a little bit. Um, yes, I know, I know you contributed recently to an article about the Congo. Uh, maybe talk about that. Hello? Hello? Oh. Yeah. Remy, can you, can you tell us a little about your, your recent article and your work there? Yeah, I am just a climate activist from Congo and I live here in the Congo rainforest. So I am honored to join this meeting by this by Zoom. <laughs> As you know, the Congo rainforest is just uh, facing treatment like destruction. Uh, deforestation rate is very, very high. So we have to join our hands to in order to protect the only F we have. As you know, the Congo rainforest is the, the world's second land. So we have to join our hands in order to protect the Congo rainforest and the indigenous people. Because here, millions of people depend on the forest for medicine, uh, for agriculture, for water, and everything. And as you know, the Congo rainforest is very, very beautiful and has an incredible biodiversity. In the Congo rainforest, you can just uh, found uh, rare, rare animals which are now in extinction, like okapi, mm -hmm. like mountain gorilla, and uh, other animals. So really, we have we have the time to to join our hands in order to protect this forest. And as you know, the Congo rainforest is helping in mitigating the climate the climate change. So if we don't do anything at this moment, the forest will disappear as many uh, scientific studies is showing that the Congo rainforest may be gone by 2100. So we have really, really the time to work very, very hard in order to, to protect the forest. So I am also very, very sorry because I, my English is very weak. As you know, the Congo is a French speaking country. I am, just, I am just trying to speak English, but as you know, French is my first language here. I am very, very happy to join this event and I am glad to, to be invited. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you a lot. I think I will join uh, perhaps when you will have another meeting. I am very, very happy Wonderful. to be invited. Good. Thank you, thank you. So thank glad you. to have you, Remy. Thank you for being here. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh, be well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh. I really just like him so much. Um, I don't think I have met an African activist that I haven't kind of, you know, have fallen in love with. <laughs> um, and people have a way of talking there. Uh, unlike uh, yours truly, who tends to be verbose. Uh, managed to say everything important in so few words and often just so beautifully. Anyhow. 
very glad he's here. Yeah. Was he? Well, um, oh, and it just, my heart is so full right now thinking of the kind of courage that it takes um, to do to do that rainforest protection work in places like Congo. Uh, and this is true in Indonesia and um, in Brazil and so many other places uh, where the tropical rainforests are, you're often working in opposition to government policy. Um, one of the you know, it's, it's never hard to find bad news about what's happening. Um, one of the bits of news that I, I encountered yesterday and sort of, okay, what's happening in Sundaland right now? Um, I had mentioned that palm oil plantations are spreading rapidly. And part of what's driving that now is the Indonesian government's decision that to meet the climate accords, they want to get off fossil fuel. And they're going to do that by clearing forests to put in palm oil plantations to make biodiesel. Um, which again is going to be a net carbon emitter for so many years before it ever breaks even. Um, and is mostly just a scheme to open up more land for exploitation. Um, but governments in so many of these countries as a legacy of colonialism find themselves with huge international debts to pay and feel that the only way they can do that is policies that transform whatever resources they have uh, into cash that they can spend to pay back their debts to their former colonizers. Um, it's, it's a brutal history that continues to have brutal consequences to this day in terms of poverty for the people who live there uh, and in terms of how people treat the forests there. Um, go ahead, Paul. Well, there's, there's kind of a place I find uh, where the good news and the bad news come together um, one of the reasons that the Amazon is so threatened, and the person who broke that story, she knew before the scientists knew that the tipping point was arriving way ahead of schedule. Uh, mm -hmm. She was an economist, uh, and she wrote about uh, how, because uh, our economic system puts no value uh, on intact rainforest, uh, you know, that until that changes, until um, there, we are valuing it uh, and, and compensating or, you know, investing or rewarding uh, countries for preserving the ecosystems on which we all depend, uh, that nothing will change. Well, that, that proposal I mentioned, the Campaign for Nature, mm -hmm. to set aside 30% of the globe, because uh, we don't value wilderness, it's very cheap. And so we could set aside 30% of uh, the land mass and oceans uh, on the planet, they think in a decade for $140 billion. That is chump change. That is uh, one fifth of America's annual defense budget. Uh, that could simply be redirected uh, to something that is, you know, a lot more relevant to our security. Um, so I think, you know, there's where there's bad news, it's about how our activity is, is causing a lot of damage. But then, you know, even there, because it's our activity, we have control over it. Um, so I tend to think depression is a, an occupational hazard of environmental activism, uh, and we have to resist it uh, and, and try to remember 
uh, that that we are fighting for the for the rest of life on Earth because we love it um, and celebrate it and are filled with awe and wonder by it. Hmm. So to help us do that, um, next I want to move us into kind of a meditation space uh, where we'll spend a little time falling back in love with the rainforests. Uh, but before we do that, we're, we're a little past the halfway point, and I just want to acknowledge that we are um, animals with bodies that, that need uh, some compassion, and therefore just to encourage and invite you, and I'm going to do it too, to just, if you can, maybe stand up, um, or just move around a little bit and stretch um, because sitting in front of a computer screen is a very taxing thing. So if you want to turn your screen off, feel free um, and just take just a minute just to sort of stretch and come back into your body. Could you possibly make me another country flagging? Are you still on? Yeah, but I'm muted. <laughs> Okay, so um, when you're ready, come settle back down, but get yourself into a nice, comfortable position uh, where you can really rest and drop into your body. In Nova Sutras, we're endeavoring to bring science and spirituality together and to find practices that celebrate the integration of our rational, emotional, intuitive, and spiritual selves. Um, trying to bring that deep reverence for the beauty and power of nature into our work in the world as a way to nourish us, to do the work as the thing that calls us to do the work. There is nothing more joyful than working in dedication to that which we love. Even though the news can be bad, Remembering that love, remembering that wonder and awe and reverence can give us unlimited reserves of strength and endurance. So we'll take a few moments to really welcome that in. Um, we're gonna focus on offering reverence healing and loving kindness for all the beings of the rainforests that are Earth's three green hearts. So just settle in, sit comfortably if you can. Um, feel free to soften your gaze or close your eyes if you want. Um, or I'll just be showing some slides with images from forests to help you um, connect with these places. And to start, I want you to really just connect with the earth herself. So feel that connection to the earth below you. Feel the way your body is supported and stabilized.
like a tree sinking its roots deep into soil. You can be nourished by this loving support of the earth that is always right there beneath us. Then I invite you to notice your breath. Feel your breath connecting you to the air above you, filling you with light. Every time you inhale, a few of the molecules of oxygen that you're taking in have traveled around the world from each of Earth's three green hearts. Every breath, this tiny bit of nourishment from Amazonia, from Congo, from Sundaland. Every breath, this gift from the mighty trees of the rainforest. So as we feel our connection to the earth beneath us, to the air moving in and out of us, to that entire atmosphere, the beautiful sky above us, take some time to think about and really offer some gratitude to those trees showing us how to link sky and soil, how to connect earth and heaven. Now I invite you to journey in your mind to the thriving heart of the Amazon. Visualize us being in that place together. Gathered beneath the trees in the heart of this vibrant rainforest. Deep in a healthy rainforest, the air is filled with soft green light. The air is rich and moist. It carries the hum of insects, the calls of birds and frogs and monkeys. An incredible variety of scents from all the different flowers and leaves and fungi everywhere in the world. The Amazon is home to an amazing diversity of people, each with their own unique culture, each with their own beautiful songs and their own ways of expressing love for their forest homeland. Feel our fellowship with these indigenous protectors of the land. Imagine being with them to raise voices and stamp our feet in celebration of the abundant beauty of the forest. The great profusion of life makes this forest almost shimmer with energy. 
Allow yourself to just envision that lush, abundant life all around you. All of the amazing animals that dwell here, jungle cats, tree frogs, hummingbirds, sloths, monkeys, lizards, butterflies. We'll pause here and send out our love to this place with wishes for its well being. May the great trees of the Amazon rainforest be well. May the twining vines, the ferns and flowers, and all the other plants and fungi that live here in their shade be well. May all the animals of this place, the salamanders, the marmosets, the katydids, the river dolphins, the jaguars, the macaws, the leafcutter ants, the river otters, may they all be well. May the rains keep these forests vibrant. May the waters of the Amazon River and all its tributaries be well. Now imagine following the great Amazon River, flying quickly down its course and out to the Atlantic, then over that ocean, and up into the mighty river curving through the middle of Africa, the Congo. Again, just let yourself open your senses to that beautiful place. The chatter of monkeys, the cries of the big hornbill birds, the rich sense of fruits and soil filling that warm, moist air. May all the colorful birds, the agile red-tailed monkeys, the stealthy leopards, the clever parrots, the graceful snakes, the elegant okapi, the profusions of butterflies, the bonobos, all the wondrous animals of the Congo rainforest. May they all be well. May the indigenous peoples of the Congo's forest, whose ancestors have lived there for millions of years, may these indigenous people be well. May all life in the Congo be well. Now we travel farther east over the volcano homes of the mountain gorillas, over the wide and stormy Indian Ocean to the island of Sumatra. Moving in from the glittering shoreline through the swampy lowland forests and up into the forests that embrace the sides of the volcanic mountains. Great trees with buttressed trunks hold ferns, lianas, orchids, and mosses. Graceful leaf monkeys browse in the treetops while clever macaque monkeys find crabs on the edge of a stream, maybe disturbing a great cloud of butterflies that were resting on the shore. Fruit bats and songbirds settle in to feed on tiny red figs that dot an enormous tree 
And then they flutter away as an orangutan swings in to claim a share. Let yourself feel the amazing vitality of these remaining healthy equatorial forests and envision that energy filling you and spreading out from you to heal all the forests around you and all the rainforests around the Earth's equator. When you're ready, allow your eyes to gently open if they've been closed. Come back into focus. Return to the here and now. Holding in your heart that connection to Earth's great three green hearts. So welcome back. Our intention now is to um, give us a chance to move from this space of love into uh, some visions of what we can do about it. And I think um, since there's just five of us left on the call, I think we'll just stay in one room together. Um, and the two questions that I wanted to bring forward for us to discuss, and I'm gonna invite you all to unmute and, and be talking. Um, Let me move back into screen share for a moment here, um, just to, to take us through our, our basic conversation agreements, but I know all of you um, know this intuitively and have mostly seen this before already. So these are the questions that we have. Um, First is Nova Sutras as still a fairly small organization. Um, what can we do to help forward this vision of thriving equatorial rainforests? And within that, what does your heart tell you uh, that is yours to do as part of that? So I'll copy these uh, into text as well, so that we have easy access to that as a reminder. There we go. Um, and I'm just gonna open it up. What, from what you've heard, from what you've thought about, what seems like the right thing to do? Spread the word. Spread the word. Educate. Yeah. That is that is um the thing that that I think we are most most called to do and, and most ready and able to do. Um and that's a big part of, of why we're um renewing our focus on these. Yeah. What was it? What was it that she said? I didn't. Oh, spread sorry. The word. Yeah. Well, spread the word. Okay. Yeah. I'm not responding so much to the two questions, but okay. But what the thing which stays with me from the presentation is the extent to which we are part of mm -hmm. the natural world. 
that the indigenous people in the rainforest apparently change the rainforest by what they cultivated. And I've heard that's true of the forest in America too. Very much, yeah. And of course, in areas like China and Europe where people were farming of one sort or the other for many years, there were changes and they found ways, but there are also of course, smaller numbers. China, I guess, is the place, maybe India, where there are larger numbers working for sustainable. But I keep on being, the other thing is how much the economics are part of it. I mean, I'm struck that broom handles and shovel handles are things that ordinary poor people use to make a living. And that when you talk about palm oil, you know, you talk about humans trying to figure out how to make a living. <laughs> and you talk about one fifth of the defense budget. And of course, there are already jobs in place making these anti life weapons which do not forward life on the planet at all, but they do feed the families of the people working in it. So that it strikes me the extent to which we need to find ways to change the economic vision mm -hmm. that we are part of the natural world we can't do it the way indigenous people did it throughout the globe because there are too many of us. We have to invent new ways to be part of it. And of course, the number of people in cities is, so there are now more people in the cities than not. That's, so it is a new world we have to invent but that image of at least a third of the planet being not being part of humanity in the way that the indigenous people in the rainforest were part of it, but not being part of it in the way that all the people in the cities can go just live there. You know, the um, but that vision of one third of the planet being mostly not human in terms of the percentage of species there. I mean, in a city, the percentage of species, except for maybe insects, insects always outnumber everybody. And of course we talk microbes, they always outnumber everything, but oh, but in terms of the larger species in cities, humans are vast numbers. But there's something about if we could think of that vision of one third of the planet being in something that's life sustaining for humans and doesn't mean that humans have to live in economic extreme poverty. I mean, I think there's this, I think there's this, I might be wrong because I am out of touch with what so much of the world that's on the internet and in the cities and such. But I suspect that there is this sense of one third of the nature for nature is this vision of this alien entity, nature. I'd like to just speak a little okay. bit to what you said. Um, first, uh, just as a matter of, of fact, nothing our government does creates fewer jobs, uh, dollar for dollar, than the Pentagon, nothing. Um, it is the least uh, 
effective way to uh, put resources into the hands of ordinary people that our government possesses. Uh, second, uh, the climate crisis itself uh, is creating poverty and creating the most destructive form of poverty, uh, which is, you know, like the inability uh, to keep children well nourished enough uh, that their growth isn't stunted, that they don't waste away or perish. Uh, so a really large chunk of Africa now, because their agriculture is rainfall dependent, uh, are victims of our fossil fuel consumption primarily, uh, you know, and I think the illusion that we want not to, I mean, I understand it, there's, people are bound to see sort of trade-offs, but the illusion I think is that there's some way in which we're benefiting, that we would have to give something of value up. Uh, that is really wrong, I think. It's all about uh, value that we are not experiencing, uh, and but could be experiencing. And also, you know, in Africa, people, even people who are, who are, you would not think of describing as indigenous, they're close enough to the earth, right? I mean, 60% of that continent's population still farms no. uh, to sustain themselves that they have this sense of continuity going back millennia. And I often think that what we in the Anglo-European developed countries uh, don't have is that mm. feeling of deep continuity with the past. And, and it can make us a little bit silly, uh, kind of like we were literally born yesterday. Whereas, you know, Antonio Nobra, when he talks to the indigenous people, one of them said to him, oh, you figured out uh, that you can't cut all the trees down because it gets very hot and very dry. And, and this is the chief, and he says to Nobra, well, we've always known that. And, and it just devastated poor Antonio uh, that, you know, his scientists, his, the scientists he knew, they'd worked with computer models, they have all this technology and all this expertise, and it had taken them 20 years uh, to really bring into focus something that was perfectly obvious to those people. And then he said, but how would you know that? Because in the uh, 10,000 years that they were in the millions in the Amazon, far more people in the Amazon there are now, uh, we're pretty sure they never cleared more than 1.5% <laughs> of the forest in the last 50 years. Uh, modern societies have cleared 20% of the Brazilian Amazon, uh, which is, it's looking like, you know, very close to enough to be fatal. So I think we want to, oh, and, uh, the entire economy of South America will vanish if the Amazon dies back. So, you know, even the capitalist profit motive should be telling us, as it is telling the Campaign for Nature people, that we have to protect it because we don't want the uh, home of 70% of South America's economy to turn into a desert, which would happen very rapidly. You know, long before we would disappear, we would be missing our goodies. Uh, so, uh, you know, I just, I don't think there really are the trade-offs uh, that we imagine sometimes. Yeah. I, just to, to address that um, from another perspective as well, um, when that was happening, the the initial harvest of the high value trees um, that was all being done by foreign companies from other nations who were hiring people from cities hundreds of miles away from the forest, sending them in with chainsaws and then exporting the logs out of the country. It had nothing to do with the poor people in Indonesia, not a thing mm -hmm. other than hiring a few people from the cities. Um, 
the people, the local people were outraged and terrified in part because, as I said, it made the, um, the tigers move around a lot more and they were starting to see tigers in their fields, um, which understandably scared the heck out of them. Um, because Sumatran tigers do generally view humans as a potential food source. Um, I think the, the last person killed by a Sumatran tiger, as far as we know, verified for sure was many decades ago, um, but it's still a possibility. So they were really, really unhappy with, with what was going on at that point. And again, when people come in to, to set up these palm oil plantations, this has nothing to do with local food supply and everything to do with uh, cash economy exports. Same um, is true in the Amazon. It would all stop uh, if it yeah. were not for multinational corporations that are making a fortune exporting beef. Uh, you know, all of it is dumb too, because yeah. the soil in the Amazon is so bad it doesn't actually even work for this type of exploitation. You very quickly exhaust it. It's not good for that. It's good for what it's good for. Polly. So the bottom line, as I see it, I mean, I was, I was gonna suggest we can, you know, we can support all the organizations that the NGOs that are that are working in the rainforest, um, but the bottom line is to increase the value of leaving of the <clears throat> the rainforest as they stand to such point where it's not profitable for for companies to go in and, and um, milk them as you, if you will. Um, in order to do that, you need to, uh, you probably need to do a number of things like have governments put a value on on leaving the rainforest the way they are, which Ecuador tried to do when it rewrote its constitution. Um, but then the, the economics again of, of their, their mounting debts to other countries meant that, that farming the, or, or raping and pillaging and taking the oil, the resources out from under the soil, minerals and fossil fuels, <clears throat> was more profitable than ecotourism, which is what Pachamama tried to, to promote. Um, so, so the question is, how do we how do we change the economic situation? It's wonderful that there are economists that actually recognize that. Um, but how do, how do we get that? That's what we need to do. We need to make those trees more valuable standing yeah. than they are cut down. The Campaign for Nature, I think those economists get it pretty right uh, when they say that, um, for example, that very little of the money that is made by destroying rainforests uh, actually gets to anyone in those countries. Right. Nearly all that money uh, goes out of the country. So within the country, this is just like a net loss, right? Uh, this and, and of course, what I said about South America is not an exaggeration. That 70% of the economy would just vanish if we don't stop uh, deforestation in the Amazon. But part of a big part of that $140 billion uh, is providing a regular stream of income 
that will reward, but more importantly, I think, provide more uh, cash income to those countries and, and peoples than they could conceivably make by exploitation. Because exploitation invariably means most of the profits leave the country. So it's not actually that hard to change their incentives. Uh, changing ourselves, changing uh, what we think of as valuable ourselves, I think is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we should not be buying anything that contains palm oil. You know, the fact that life on earth, a lot of it w could conceivably end, right? Because there's these tipping points where just like a little thing uh, can be fatal. Life could end for palm oil uh, is, is just kind of, you know, people lived without palm oil for nearly all of their existence. Uh, so, you know, why aren't there supermarkets that you can walk into where there is nothing uh, that ever involved uh, destroying a rainforest? And, and why don't companies like JBS get put out of business? They're the company that exports the beef from the Amazon. They have been caught over and over and over. They always, oh no, we don't source our beef. They do, they get caught. We need to put them out of business. And my friends in Africa, my, I think just to speak for them, they are incredulous uh, that people in America can describe themselves as powerless, uh, you know, most climate activists in Africa, it's not safe what they're doing. In most of Africa, it's not safe. In Uganda, where Vanessa Nakati, this lion of a climate activist who is changing the world, uh, came from, he's just thrown into jail or worse. Remy is in active fear of his life. Uh, so, no, we are not powerless. <laughs> you know, if we lose our freedoms, it will be because it will be of disuse. Yeah. Uh, so let's use them. Hang on, just a second. Yeah. Paul, thank you. I apologize. Oh no. I got to talk. Hi. When I said what I said, it, I just want to mention that it's not because I thought it made sense, for instance, to make missiles, but I need to go at this at it from this kind of almost stupid, naive perspective to try to find and then provoke your response or other people's, you know, or our thinking. I think that Nova Sutras can align itself with this, what is it, 30% or 50% of the earth, or and align as we did with this rain, faith rainforest. In other words, as a small organization, aligning ourselves. And I think well, if we can really try to think of how to rephrase and how to re-envision. I mean, I guess that's what I'm trying to think about when I'm thinking of, when I talk about the economics. I mean, okay, so the economy of some country I don't, I barely know the name of in South America collapses. What does that mean to me compared to the fact that I'm trying to get a job to feed my family. You know, that to reframe, to work on reframing the way that things are seen and the connections are seen so that the military is at least seen as not a big job producer even if you believe you need weapons to defend our country, you at least aren't thinking that at the same time, you're getting economic security. Or that if we're using, I mean, palm oil is in a lot of things. 
a lot. I have tried unsuccessfully many times to absolutely purge and not pick up anything with palm oil. And it almost can't be done um, because they don't have to label that it's palm oil. They don't have to label where it came from. Um, and a lot of it is under, you know, it's such and such laurel palmate, this and that. Um, and all of the, the green brands are using palm oil. Some of it's organic. So great, no pesticides. Um, some of it is certified by this group called the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil. It's, you know, um, probably so deceptive that it's doing more harm than good because their, their principles are basically, well, you can't have cleared the land in the last five years in order to be certified or it's some, something like that, um, which basically just means that there's this sort of shifting market of people who've been in the market longer uh, can claim that their oil palms are rainforest safe just because they got there first. Um, and again, with this new initiative from the Indonesian government, I am just appalled and devastated. And um, it was bad enough when they wanted to turn Borneo into rice plantations. Um, but this idea that they're going to try to run their country off biodiesel made from palm oil is just horrifying. Another thing we can do is start conversations that are desperately needed and in America at least are really not happening. Uh, we need to have a conversation about what are personal choices and what are collective choices. One of the differences between us and my friends in Africa, and then it's a much bigger or more it's a much more dramatic difference if you're looking at indigenous people. Why is 80% of our biodiversity on indigenous land, right? It's because they believe in community rights. So there is the right that they have and then all the future generations have uh, to be a part of a world that is as vital and alive as the one they were born in. And we need community rights. We need to understand that we have rights as a people and our posterity have rights. And those rights link us together with the rest of life, which also has rights. Uh, there, there is a right for things to be. And, and the, the whole logic that says, uh, no, you don't have a right to exist until I find you useful which is how our economic system uh, treats rainforests and people. Uh, you know, in America right now, we have a mass eviction crisis. We have a child hunger crisis uh, because our economic system says, uh, we're so concerned that you might not be useful uh, that we're gonna starve your children and throw them on the street in a raging pandemic uh, if you don't do what we find useful. That kind of violence, that reducing people and, and, and life in all its forms to objects of use, and the underlying assumption that life on its own terms is waste. John Locke wrote that in his sort of blueprint for liberal democracy uh, that na he described nature as almost like indolent, like a bum just lying around doing nothing. Uh, <laughs> you know, we who don't actually believe that inside can change how our culture talks. Uh, and that to me is a, a clear Nova Sutra's mission is to try to uh, develop a language uh, that doesn't come from the dumbest uh, most predatory, short-sighted, myopic, and unlikable part of us. <laughs> uh, 
because we've heard more than enough from that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So was it Molly who had lived in Zambia? Cecily. Yeah. Pardon? Cecily. Me, Cecily. So it was Cecily. I was born in Zambia. Born in Zambia. So. so you have a whole different feel within your neurology, you might say. Right. In right. your brain, you, you, you know with your body that the rainforest is alive. I have that feel for the well, I grew up in New England and spent quite a bit of time in upper New York state. So I have that kind of body feel mm -hmm. and my parents love the out of doors. So I have that kind of body feel. Yeah. Uh, and then when I came to California over the years I've been here, I've slowly allowed myself to absorb what this is. Mm. But I, when I was in Buffalo, New York, I worked at a science museum in the junior education department. And I led science, you know, nature walks. There was a nature preserve that we could take classes to. Oh, and, so. wow. and I know that when a child doesn't grow up free to roam, that like bugs are you. I mean, that can be overcome if you're allowed to play around in the water with crayfish, which are, and the bugs in the water don't provoke the, or invoke the, the sort of yuck ooh response because you've never seen them before or haven't seen them much. And they're fascinating things like little caddis flies that build little homes to build live in out of sand or sticks and they look pretty weird, but it's not something they've been taught is something that doesn't belong in the house or, so there is this, this need to find a way to frame and connect with people who find the trees a little scary. Mm -hmm just because it's unfamiliar. Yeah. And in nature stuff, they often connect with it by making it cutesy. So that makes it safe. Yeah. And the film Born in China which was an incredible, which was a Disney film, but was incredibly well done. Um, and it did the Disney thing of making a particular, particular animal's family personal. And I saw the document, uh, you know, the, the documentary film on the filming of that. And what they went through to film the snow leopards. Mm -hmm. And then the particular family they chose, the mother couldn't hunt, was injured in the hunt, and the two little cubs been following it in the, towards adolescence probably died. Mm -hmm. They didn't explicitly say that, and I don't think they explicitly found the bodies. But they probably died because They'd spent all this time, but they probably died because as happens, she'd been, the mother had been chased out by another mother with grown adolescent sons and where they were more powerful. She'd been chased to a territory that was less easy to hunt in. Mm -hmm. And then I saw in the comments on the film, there was one mother who was horrified that they dared to have a film 
in which the family they followed didn't have a happy ending. She was totally upset because it upset her daughter. And it's like, it's, <laughs> there's something about this that I think is part of the Nova Sutra's job of connecting people who don't have it in their bones and neurons that we are connected. Realize how deeply we are connected and see if we can start to find ways to connect it to the bones and neurons. And then the other part is connect the economics in a way that makes sense. I would love it if we could have indigenous people more. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I mean, like Hindu would be great. Yeah. Uh, Ibrahim to have. Um, there is a whole thing I haven't mentioned, but it, it goes right to something the Oma has about the economics. She and I, Hindu and I, have been talking about how there's all these people in Africa who for millennia that what they've done to live is farm. And now because of climate change, they can't. Mm -hmm. uh, the combination of drought and flooding often in the same place where you go directly from drought to flood uh, is making it so their families can no longer sustain their lives that way. So she and I have been talking about how they are a natural labor force for ecosystem restoration. And they have all the right knowledge and all the right skills. Mm -hmm. They are the obvious people to be doing that work. Um, and the trajectory for Africa is a catastrophe for the whole of humanity uh, if we don't do that work. Yeah. So um, it would be great if we could say, oh, well, hey, here's all these people. Uh, they're, they're not used to relying on a cash economy. They don't need to be paying a ton. We need to give them a decent life and, and, and give them a thing to do that serves life. Something I think we all crave uh, is a way to serve life. Yeah. You know, that's what life does. Life receives life by giving it. Just like the, you know, the rainforest, the trees take a little bit of the water and then whatever they don't need to survive, they, they put back in the atmosphere. And, you know, the giving and receiving is so much of where the, the intercourse, you know, I mean, the almost erotic satisfaction in being alive is so much of that. Uh, but, but anyhow, that's an example of something. Her, the idea that she and I have been talking about, uh, where it mostly, we need other people talking about it. Yeah. Right, this is a conversation that has to become a thing and, and hopefully in kind of short order. And then we could also be a social networking space in a kind of way, mm -hmm. uh, because I have not had time to follow up and try to get a hold of John Liu, but Hindu and I, that was our next step is we wanted to get John D. Liu who made the film Green Gold and who does, is the founder of Ecosystem Restoration Camps. Uh, is a brilliant speaker on ecology. I don't know anyone who is not indigenous who can d d speak about ecology so beautifully. He has changed people in like one sitting, you know, changed uh, people from big destructive uh, engineering firms that do big destructive projects and they listen to him and, and then they want to help green the desert. So, um, but anyhow, we, we could be a place to bring that kind of yeah. thing together. So that, um, I want to point out that we're, we're uh, past our intended closing time. Um, so I'd like to start winding this down soon, uh, but we can, we can stay on a couple minutes if there's more that needs to be said. But I did want to comment um, in addition to, yeah, trying to provide a platform for more um, for people like Hindu um, and, and finding local activists in uh, Amazonia and 
in Sundaland that we can also, um, you know, sort of highlight and bring their voices in. Um, we're also working with local indigenous folks and I, Liza had to leave the call early, but um, she and I are in conversation. And one of the things that we're going to be doing soon, I hope is uh, doing some kind of event as a fundraiser for uh, Friends of Eurostock and the um, Amamutsun Land Trust. Uh, so that's, that's something that's coming up. But that um, kind of leads me into, I'm just going to post the, um, some of our upcoming events uh, in the chat here. So if you, you can save the chat, you can get that. But it's all listed at novasutras.org slash events. And we've got a few things coming up. A um, couple things on Wednesday and Friday of next week, uh, in addition to I didn't quite get them in order, but uh, there's every Thursday we have an open discussion at 1130. Um, so I think that's, I, I'm, I'm not going to do the rest of the, the other Nova Sutras closing. You've all um, heard that and you can always ask me if you have questions. Um, but I want to, see if there, there are other things that need to get said before we start to close out here. Just in appreciation, both yourself and Paul, Michelle, thank you for your, your knowledge and sharing your passion and blessing. Thank you. Yes. I, I'll echo that. Um, I thought I was pretty up on the causes of climate change. Um, and, but the connections, this discussion has really helped me to see uh, more of the, of how everything is connected and Oh, I did want to share one thing, but well, I, it can wait. Uh, other than I will just mention that we are launching a new website um, kind of outside. There's a, an Earth's Three Green Hearts section on the Nova Sutras website, but we realize that for some people it's going to be going to make more sense to them to to have a website that's just focused on the rainforest stuff without kind of going through Nova Sutras. So we've got um, earth3greenhearts.org. I will put that uh, in the links here as well. Um, and that's, that's a website in progress. So we'd love your feedback on that. Uh, and we'll try to do a bigger public launch of it in the coming months, but um, wanted to at least get that into people's hands from this. And I'll try to send for everyone who registered, I'll, I'll send these notes out. And um, uh, there were a few people who weren't on and there will be, we'll have this on YouTube as well. Oh. Um, so we can, we can share it with the folks who weren't able to make it. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, Anything else or shall we close out here? So I just, uh, to give us just a moment to kind of drop back in to reconnect with that incredible beauty of the forest and let that fill our hearts for just a moment more. And then if there's a word or two or a phrase that comes up for you from that, uh, feel free to just speak it as it comes up. Gratitude. Rededication and devotion.
lifelong. Mm -hmm. All are connected. Love. <clears throat> Thank you all for your amazing hearts and wonderful presence today. Um, and we like to, to try to reach out and hold hands here on Zoom. And you guys can actually hold hands. That's so great. Okay. Oh, thank you all for being with us. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Michelle. Bless you. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thanks thank you. so much, Paul, for all your work on this. Thank you, Eleanor.